I'm George Mariner Mole, the Artistic Director of the Discovery Orchestra, and your host for this evening's Classical Conversation. The Discovery Orchestra teaches the listening skills that help people really connect with classical music. We achieve this through our media programs, our chat videos online, our Emmy-nominated public television shows, and our radio program called Inside Music on WWFM in Princeton. Our television shows are on NJPAC's website on the NJPAC In Your Living Room page under the Learn Something tab. So visit that page at NJPAC and also visit the Discovery Orchestra's website to find out more about us at, www at, at discoveryorchestra.org. Also, take a look at our Learn at Home page when you get there. And now I'd like us to begin this journey into the Rite of Spring. And so begins the musical score that on May 29, 1913, caused sophisticated Parisian ballet attendees to act in most unseemly ways. All of you can imagine how shocked you would be if at the very start of an NJ Pack performance, someone in the audience yelled, call a doctor, after which another yelled even louder, call a dentist. <laughs> but this is what happened as the music we just listened to started that May evening and things went downhill from there. It's said that audience members began throwing objects at the musicians in the pit and the dancers on stage. Some accounts say the police were summoned. Was it the music, the subject matter, the choreography, or perhaps a combination of all three of these things? This evening, we'll be primarily focused on the music. Just in a personal footnote, in 1979, 66 years after the premiere of this work, I was the assistant conductor of the New Jersey Symphony. The Rite of Spring was in the orchestra's repertoire for the 1979-80 season. And the first concert to feature the Stravinsky score was in Montclair. I vividly remember as Maestro Thomas Mahalik began to conduct the opening bars of the Rite of Spring, that more than a few patrons got up and left the Montclair High School Auditorium where the NJSO was performing that evening. As the music progressed, others followed. I was a bit surprised by this, but let's jump right into the music. Look at the listening guide for tonight's conversation. Some of you may have downloaded it and printed it for yourselves, but if not, not a problem. Just look at it now on screen. I've yellow highlighted some items. Stravinsky's toolbox, exotic timbres and simple folk tunes. Look now at number one. I'm going to start the music at number one and I'd like you to identify which instrument is playing the solo at number one. Are you ready? Did I hear some of you say bassoon? If so, I must say bravo and brava. Composers seldom write music that high for the bassoon to play. In that upper register, it's difficult to recognize the bassoon, which probably elicited those caustic remarks from the premier audience members, thinking maybe the first bassoonist needed a doctor. The normal sound we associate with the bassoon is like this very short solo from Beethoven's Fourth Symphony. <laughs> That's the sound we associate normally. Well, let's continue to explore Stravinsky's penchant for exotic timbres or tone colors. Having the bassoon play a melody based on a Lithuanian folk song in such a high register is a good example of these exotic timbres. While we're at it, I'd like to play for you the uh, Lithuanian folk tune which Stravinsky modified on the keyboard.
So we find what he used there, but this is of course a little different than what finally came out in the bassoon. Now he uses other exotic timbres in the introduction at number one, such as two bass clarinets playing humorous arpeggios and the sound of four flutes playing with the English horn. I'll start the music where the bass clarinets come in, followed by those four flutes and the English horn. The focus of my lectures at NJPAC over the past 17 years has always and will always be the same, and that is to encourage you to listen better. So it's time for a little test of our listening skills. When the music starts, there will be a rapid buildup, but then get suddenly soft. It will sound then just like the beginning with the bassoon playing Stravinsky's adaptation of that Lithuanian folk song. Raise your hand or an eyebrow or something when the solo bassoon returns. I knew you could do it. Uh, we have to begin with some easy challenges. Let's take another look inside Stravinsky's compositional toolbox. I've highlighted unexpected accents and number two in the listening guide, the augurs of spring and dances of the adolescent girls. Augur, of course, is another word for portend, a sign or warning that something momentous or even calamitous is likely to happen. We'll come back to what that something is in a moment, but for now, let's concentrate on those adolescent dancing girls. In the original staging of the ballet, number two is where the curtain rises and the lights come up on those girls. Stravinsky makes great use of unexpected accents. They're often frightening in the context of this ballet. I'm going to start the music again midway through the introduction at number one. Make some physical response, raise a hand, a finger, or your eyebrows, whatever's comfortable for you to do when you detect those unexpected accents. This will also not be difficult. Pretty hard to miss. And we really can't tell when the next accent will come. They're unexpected, irregular, and those accented chords are also quite dissonant. I've been teaching music listening now for 50 years, and for 50 years, my students have been asking me the same question. Why did the European composers of the early and mid 20th century write such dissonant music? It's so difficult to listen to. In the case of this particular score though, it's time now to discuss the narrative or plot of this ballet, which was the brainchild of Stravinsky himself and ethnographer Nikolai Rerich. Long story short, we're talking here about child sacrifice. And Stravinsky's score certainly reflects this whole ritual. It may seem hard to believe in 2020 that thousands of years ago, 
tribes of human beings believed the only way to ensure that there would be enough rain, sunshine, food to eat, as in animals to hunt in the forest, was to annually sacrifice children and sometimes adults as well. As we know, the Mayans and Aztecs were still sacrificing people in this hemisphere when the Europeans arrived. This is why I think the Abraham and Isaac story is so important. When Abraham was alive, tribes all over the planet were sacrificing children. And he was getting ready to do the same thing himself when the angel of God said, no, don't do it. <laughs> now, whether we believe this event literally took place or whether we believe this is an allegory, the important truth underlying the story is that a tribe of human beings decided, no mas, we're not going to do this anymore. Now, the audience at the premiere may well have been shocked by the story of this ballet, but certainly the music sounded like nothing they'd ever heard. Stravinsky's first big hit, The Firebird, written in 1910 for Sergei Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, definitely contained some dissonant sections, but it made ample use of folk songs that were quite lovely, really, Russian folk songs, like the one in this clip from the Discovery Orchestra's latest public television show, Discover the Firebird. All very listenable, don't we think? And Stravinsky's 1911 score for the Ballet Russe Petrushka, the 1911 score, even with its use of bitonality, that's another term you'll see in Stravinsky's toolbox there, didn't stretch listener sensibilities to the degree that the Rite of Spring did. If you're wondering about that artwork that keeps reappearing, <laughs> it's Henri Rousseau's painting, The Snake Charmer. It graced the cover of the very first recording of the Rite of Spring I purchased as a teenager. That recording was of course a 33 and a third long play vinyl recording. And I guess the record producer thought that the painting portrayed a sensual prehistoric apparition and put it on the sleeve. I've always liked that painting. In any event, look at number three in the guide, Game of Abduction. Now, abduction doesn't sound like a very fun game to me. Uh, my guess is that sacrificial victims did not necessarily uh, volunteer to uh, be sacrificed. I'm assuming that once someone, in this case a teenage girl, was selected, she had to be forcibly abducted against her will from her family, and she probably tried to outrun her captors. Stravinsky does a good job of musically portraying a chase and eventual capture. I'll start the music at number three. Make some physical sign of recognition when you think this poor soul has been grabbed and subdued. Another item in that toolbox is the word ostinato. An ostinato, obviously an Italian term, is a melodic figure, usually on the short side, that repeats over and over and over again, like this one from the Rite of Spring. Dum bum bee ba bee ba bee ba dum ba bee ba dum ba bee ba. 
Ostinato is a musical device that has been with us many thousands of years, undoubtedly back into prehistory. In fact, if one were to make a study of the music of present day hunting and gathering societies, we would find them using ostinatos in their music. It's a simple way to create a background for another melody. In the early 20th century, some classical composers began employing ostinatos and Stravinsky was certainly one of those who did. We're going to listen again to that previous excerpt and I'd like you to listen for two things, the ostinatos and another exotic instrumental timbre or tone color. The contrabassoon makes some incredibly obscene sounds in this excerpt. This instrument is so large that it has a retractable pin to hold it in the floor, just like a cello or a contrabass and it can play very low notes. So are you ready? Make a gesture of recognition when you notice a short melodic fragment being repeated over and over again, and when you detect the contrabassoon. We gave you a little visual help there with the contrabassoon, but I hope you all noticed that this passage was full of ostinatos. Stravinsky makes use of them throughout the Rite of Spring. In traditional harmony, we have what are known as chord progressions. A melody will be harmonized by different chords in these progressions. Since it's near Thanksgiving, why don't we take the melody, bless this house, and I'll play the melody first by itself and then harmonize it with a progression of different chords. Now, parallel harmony is another device that began to be used in the late 1800s by composers such as Debussy and others followed the practice in the 20th century as well. Instead of changing chords, the same chord follows the notes of the melody up and down wherever they go. I'll play a passage by Debussy because Debussy's melody is a little strange to start with. My harmonization will also sound a little bit unconventional, but I will use different chords for each note of that melody. Debussy will use the same chord, the same ninth chord, to harmonize each note in the melody. First, I'll play the melody alone, then harmonize it with a chord progression of mine, and then play Debussy's parallel harmonization. I hope you could tell that all those chords were the same when Debussy harmonized this. At number four in the listening guide, the spring round dances, Stravinsky creates some incredibly earthy, sensual sounding music. Obviously quite a provocative dance is going on here. You'll find occasional parallel harmonization here as well. It begins with trills in the flute and a very simple ancient sounding melody. Have a listen.
Now, before the round dances are over, I believe Stravinsky gives us a musical description of the psychological state of the sacrificial victim, sheer terror. This is accomplished by using very dissonant parallel harmonies coupled with a huge crescendo or getting louder. One can only imagine what it would like, what it would feel like to know that you're about to be sacrificed. Listen to the last section of listening guide number four. The sounds that Stravinsky elicits from the orchestra here are beyond amazing. I'd like to return to my music listening students question. Why did the European composers of the early and mid 20th century write such dissonant music? Well, in the case of this ballet, it's very obvious. Um, he wanted to portray um, something really dreadful and he succeeded musically. The audience that attended the premiere of the Rite of Spring must have felt that their world or at least their musical world had totally lost its moorings. Truth is, their whole world was about to become unglued. World War I would start the very next year in 1914. And while we may take some comfort in the fact that we no longer are ritually sacrificing our children to please the gods, or are we no longer ritually sacrificing our children? How many young people were there among the 20 million civilian and military dead during World War I? And we know that World War I was just the first act of a two act drama. When I think about European composers of the 20th century, they got to witness these two world wars in their own backyard, unlike those of us living here in the United States. So while we may not like the sounds that they created, we may have at least some understanding of the circumstances they lived through. Well, it's time for the games the games of the rival tribes at number five. Games are better than wars. Listen for the question and answer effect between the various parts of the orchestra, alias the various towns. I'm going to start the music a little before number five. Make a gesture again of recognition when it sounds like the games have begun. I do want us to listen to the entire work that the Israel Philharmonic was going to play for us before the pandemic canceled all such performances around the globe. But before we do, I wanted to talk about two remaining items in Stravinsky's toolbox. The first of these, bitonality. 
playing in two different keys at the same time was another musical concept whose time had come when the 20th century arrived. You can play in two or more keys simultaneously that do not clash, and Stravinsky did that on occasion, but you can also play in two keys simultaneously that really clash, if that's the emotion you wish to create. In the Rite of Spring, there comes a moment when the two clarinets demonstrate this beautifully. I'll play on the piano the melody Stravinsky wrote. Then I'll play it in another key of my choosing. Then I'll play those two keys together. After that, I'll do the same thing with Stravinsky's two choices of keys. Dissonant. In the sacrificial dance of the Chosen One, the last section of the ballet score, we have a great example of Stravinsky's love of changing meters. Meter signatures in music tell us how many beats there are in a measure and what kind of note gets one beat. Uh, for those of you who have studied music, you can imagine how tricky it would be counting in different measures, different meters, one after another. We would have things like one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. <laughs> it's complicated. It's tricky. And although it may not sound so challenging when we hear it performed in concert, it is very challenging, even for the finest orchestras, to navigate these passages. Um, that's why we practice for hours and hours. This also contains a moment in the sun for the bass clarinet, again, one of our exotic timbres. Have a listen to this changing meter section preceded by the solo in the bass clarinet. get the idea. In this first half, you have actually been listening to Kent Nagano conducting the London Symphony Orchestra. This evening, we're going to listen to one of the recommended YouTube performances of this work that I've provided. It's again the London Symphony Orchestra under Sir Simon Rattle. The uh, videography is fantastic in terms of seeing the orchestra playing and um, the performance itself is just magnificent. As always, the more we perceive, the more we receive. The more musical detail that we notice in a piece of music, the more pleasure we receive from listening to it. So as we listen now, you will see that the movements are listed on screen in this performance by the London Symphony. Be ready to detect things that we have been discussing, simple folk-like tunes, unexpected accents, ostinatos, those repeating ideas, Da, de, da, de, da, de, da. parallel harmonies, bitonality, and changing meters. So let's now listen to uh, Sir Simon. Uh, with the London Symphony, we're going to um, turn on the YouTube performance, I think, at this point.
my back on. <laughs> Well, assuming that uh, I'm speaking now, um, I just want to say that uh, it would be very interesting to talk to some of the players in the orchestra, uh, having played the piece, never conducted it, but having played the piece in orchestras myself, uh, that last section, the meters are changing so rapidly, uh, you almost feel like you've got to just hang on for dear life. It's sort of like you get in the groove and you can't even think about what you're doing. You just <laughs> keep playing <laughs> and somehow it works. Um, I remember reading about a bass player in the New York Philharmonic who was describing how harrowing it was to play the last uh, section of the, of the sacrificial dance with all of its changing meters. But I would be happy to answer questions if there are any. Um, I really can't tell what's technologically happening right now. Um, so if you have questions and if not, um, I see maybe some are coming, but not sure. Um, what I want to say is that I think that that piece is certainly uh, for me, one of the great works of the 20th century and one of the great pieces of music ever written. It was so groundbreaking for him to create something like that. And I think that it, it, it's interesting to me that it still is such an, uh, an assault on our listening and uh, people who go to the concerts. I mean, obviously um, most people, I guess, who show up at concerts have some idea what they're in for at this point. But um, the other thing I was thinking while we were watching this was when the, when the um, videotape or when the YouTube just stopped for a moment in mid-performance. I was thinking, well, yes, it will sure be nice to get back to when we can be performing live for everyone again. And uh, that will be a great time, but who knows when that will be. Could be sometime. Doesn't seem like we have any questions. So what I wanna say in conclusion is just that it is my privilege to be with you and I hope that you will be ready for our December event in which the music will be much more listenable, the music of Chopin, and uh, we'll be playing something that was going to be on the program, um, but again, <laughs> will not happen live, but we'll make it interesting. So thank you all so much for being here with us. And I guess this is it. Oh, here's a question. When is this, uh, okay, is the orchestra that large, is the question, when they do it with ballet? And of course it can't be. Uh, there, there is um, a restriction obviously in the pit about how many people you can put in there, but some of the pits of the larger houses in Europe can hold almost all of the required players. Um, there were probably 110 people or more on stage for the performance we just watched uh, and obviously there are not too many pits that can hold that many people. I find the second part not as compelling as the first um, is the question. My thoughts. Um, I actually, I, I find, you know, it's interesting. You're probably right. Um, but when it's seen as it's played, what is happening on stage, I guess, maybe makes up for that um, lack in the second part. Um, but there's still some very, very dramatic things that happen there. By the way, I urge you all to watch the, the uh, YouTube of the Kirov uh, Orchestra and Ballet um, doing the original staging. Uh, it's one of, the th one of the links I gave you and um, it's just, um, it's almost a religious experience for musicians to watch that recreation of the ballet that took place that evening. I wondered if any of you noticed any of the strange looking instruments on stage. <laughs> we had Wagner tubas, we had a bass trumpet, 
Some of you may have noticed that one of the trumpets was bigger than all the others, and the horn players had to double on the Wagner tubas, which are very strangely shaped. He left out nothing in this score, any instrument he could find. <laughs> oh my, well, other questions? Yes, the washboard, absolutely. I hope you noticed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's also, of course, fun to watch conductors. I, I love watching other conductors conduct. When I thank you all, thank you all. Okay, I'm getting the sign that whenever I say we're done, we're done. So I guess we're done. I was just going to say that when I go to these concerts, uh, I sit in a box so that I can watch the conductor very carefully. Please do a session on the Symphony of Psalms. I would love to sometime. It's not in the repertoire for NJ Pack this year, but one of the last um, performances that Pierre Boulez, uh, yeah, without a score, right? Pierre Boulez. Uh, conducted of the New York Philharmonic when he was the music director. I had just moved to New York City and I had gotten a job um, singing in the chorus of the New York Philharmonic. It was a professional chorus called, um, oh, let's see, Abe Kaplan, the Camerata Singers was the name of the chorus. Anyway, we did the Symphony of Psalms on that concert with Pierre Boulez and it was such a thrill. And I have conducted that work as well. So we'll keep it in the hopper. Well, um, Thank you all so much for being here and we look forward to seeing you in December.